Hello, welcome to episode three of our webinar series on the API facade pattern. Let's uh, get started. So as you know, hopefully at this point we have a Google group called API Craft. It's a great spot to hang out and talk about API stuff from business to technology. We have all these videos that we make available up on YouTube at youtube.com slash Apogee. We have an IRC channel available. This is a newer thing. Uh, it's on Freenode. It's uh, API hyphen craft. And let's get started. So the webinar short series, we are on episode three. The last two episodes, we covered an overview and then talked about some of the common patterns that uh, we see in the API facade pattern. And uh, today, we're going to talk about the actual technology you would use to implement an API facade. Uh, so our topics are really pretty simple. We're going to take one quick slide to recap what this thing is all about. And then we're going to just drive through pretty quickly in about 15 minutes uh, all the different variations of stuff that you would use in the API facade to make it work. And at the end of this, we're going to end up with like an enumerated list of about uh, 10 technologies that are at the heart of uh, implementing an API facade. So to recap, the API facade is a really simple architectural idea that between your app developers and your apps, you put a beautiful API design that is powered by an API facade, which in turn uh, masks all the complexity of whatever internal systems are actually powering that capability. So let's dig into the technology. As I've said in uh, sessions in the past in this series, uh, a really good design principle here is to follow the ideas of test-driven development. In that spirit, I suggest the first thing that you set up in your API facade is your test environment. So here's an example of going in and saying that your, your mobile app or your web app, whatever it is, is going to make its request through api-test.who.com, where who.com would be your domain. And in order to do this, you go into your DNS provider and you create a CNAME entry called api-test, and then that points to your API facade. So the technology you would need to do this are, are twofold. One is a DNS provider, and the second is some kind of cloud platform. In this scenario, I'm talking about doing this as if you were in a, using a cloud platform, whether it's Amazon or Google App Engine or Heroku or what have you, um, because it's the most complicated case. If all this stuff is behind your firewall, it gets simpler. Um, I just thought we'd tackle this one and kind of you know make the umbrella as big as possible. So now with this API uh, facade set up, so this assumes again you've got something running on an API, uh, sorry, a cloud platform with an IP address. You give that IP address to your DNS provider, and then the next thing to do is to bang out the first pattern we talked about last week, which is uh, the data stubs and the errors. This is just to make sure that you can uh, have the, the, the solid foundation of all the ways that you can do test-driven development. So make sure your HTTP codes are in place, that your, your error uh, responses are in there, and that you can, you can stub out your data to support the mock equals true and raise equals uh, 404 or whatever uh, HTTP code that you, you'd like to see there. So this, in order to do this, in, now that you've got your DNS set up and something pointing at a cloud uh, platform, now in that cloud platform, you're actually going to have um, hooked up. In this case, you would only really need a static web server because this is a static content um, or an app server for more dynamic stuff. Um, and then, or an, al an al alternative is an API gateway, which is more of like a Swiss army knife for dealing with HTTP stuff like this. So now we've got, uh, we've got this set up. Then the next step is to um, actually think about how your production environment would look. So this is the similar idea. You're going to add another CNAME entry to your DNS. Uh, this one just called API. You point it to the same Cloud platform, it doesn't have to be the same. You could have a separate one for test and production if you wanted to, but in this case, just to simplify it, you could have it uh, pointing to the same one. And then now in that API facade, um, you know, whatever technology you use, whether it's an API gateway or app server, or whatever, somehow you need to specify the IP address to the actual target. Um, and this is the system that's going to be running things. Notice you still want to keep that error capability that you had um, previously here because it's, it's clearly important for test, but it's, it's also important for actually running the production system. Uh, this is, again, to ensure that you have really strong verbose error messages and the error codes are, are really comprehensive for the different types of things that can happen in production. So now what we've added, essentially, if you can imagine now, you'll be having requests coming in to both API hyphen test and API. So the, the, the addition that we're adding here, um, beyond, besides just including the target IP address is including that shunt, which will point you to the subdomain, um, I'm sorry, will understand what the subdomain is and then know where to point things, whether it's just to the data stub server or off to some internal systems. Um, many um, 
web servers, app servers, and API gateways have this capability included. In fact, when we did the first version of Apigee, uh, I built a subdomain routing thing for Ruby on Rails, which is open source. I think since then, Ruby on Rails actually has it included in the, in the out-of-the-box stuff, but uh, you can find it for most platforms. So now that we've done that, then we can think about versioning. So here you can see a request is coming in with V2. Uh, same type of thing, goes through DNS, hits your API facade, and now what we're adding to the system is URL routing, just like the subdomain routing, except it's doing URL parsing. And here you can imagine where maybe V1 of your facade points at a big old system, whereas V2 is pointing at some big unproven new system, and you want a simple way to shunt between those two IP addresses. That's, so that was adding uh, URL routing. Now here's the case that um, is a really important case to think about when you're doing the API facade. So if somebody manages to figure out you know, what um, your API facade is actually pointing to, so imagine again that your facade is running say on Amazon EC2, um, you want all those mobile app requests or web app requests coming through the facade, but if somebody got their IP address um, you know, from your, the system that the API facade is pointing to, then they would be able to bypass your, your facade and then you're gonna get into a whole bunch of trouble. You won't be able to track those uh, requests and you won't be able to apply all the interesting business logic or I should say uh, API design logic that you, that you have in place in the facade. So to counteract that, you create a, you know, a firewall where you block all the traffic coming to that IP address unless it's from the trusted IP address of the API facade. So in this case, what we're doing is we're adding in our firewall, we allow the IP address of the API facade. So in this case, it might be the IP address from your Amazon instance. You know, that would be the only thing allowed to come into the, through the firewall. And that way that's gonna force that mobile app you know, you're gonna set up a nice simple response that says, you know, sorry, you know, 404 not found or whatever you wanna return back to the, to the client, okay? So that's, once you've gotten to this point, you've got a really nice lockdown system where all your requests are, are routing through the facade. Um, now you can start to do interesting things. So um, we're all we're changing really between the last setup and this one is we're adding a geographically distributed DNS where the DNS will, um, based on, the source of the request, it will, it will send the app to a geographically um, close API facade. So you might ask yourself, why would you wanna do this? The number one use case for this is caching. So you might have, you know, especially for social, for apps that have a social network element to that, um, you might cache a bunch of information that will really never go across regions. So you can make sure that the, um, the, the clients enjoy a really fast experience because the facade is caching response, API responses right there where the, um, the request originated. So in this case, what we've added is uh, GeoDNS. Uh, that's, you know, there's a bunch of providers out there that do that. And then we put right in the API facade some caching capability. You can imagine this could be memcached or uh, maybe even Redis or something like that to, to make that happen. So all that we've added again is, um, you know, we've told the DNS, I didn't explicitly put this here, but you've told the DNS now that based on the region, you have two different, you know, IP addresses that you want to target. Uh, in this case, it'd be 1234 and 1235 uh, in this slide. And then you go from there. Okay, so another common pattern that we see is this one here where you have oftentimes when an API gets exposed the wrong way, the, the, what you're seeing on your left-hand side when looking at the slide is, is an anti-pattern. Um, this is where you, your API uh, on each system might be really fine grained and require a lot of chatty stuff and it maybe doesn't represent the best design to the, the app or the app developer. Um, so by putting the facade in there, you can actually orchestrate across a number of those calls. So there are orchestration technologies which are more policy oriented and configuration based or my personal preference for a lot of this stuff, if it's complicated, is to just write it in code. I mean, code is one of the best orchestration tools ever created. Um, but it's up to the, it's really up to the skill set of the API team or the, you know, the, the time and capacity you have to do it. So in this slide, we've added some orchestration capabilities. Next is uh, the ability to do transformations. So you can imagine you start out with an XML document and you want to get JSON out on the other side of it. In the API facade, you can use a trans some kind of transformation library like XSL, XSLT is a pretty common one to create this type of, this type of output. So you hopefully you sense that we keep beefing up what's in the facade. Uh, then the next bit is compression. This is a common use case, especially when you have really verbose, uh, large XML documents. Usually those are driven by standards uh, that require a lot of uh, verbosity. Um, you don't necessarily want to clog down bandwidth, and especially for mobile apps, you know, run down the battery of the, you know, firing up the antenna to put across these big payloads. So then you can put in a compression, a compression library or compression engine to make those uh, things smaller. 
And then finally is uh, the idea of taking care of authorization. So you can imagine that when a request comes into the facade, uh, there's an OAuth token or multiple you know, indicators of the authorization scheme that you're using. And the facade can actually go out and make, that, uh, make the calls out to the, whatever your authorization system of record is to ensure that the request is valid. And if it is, then the facade passes the request back onto the core system. And if it's not, it returns it uh, right back with some kind of invalid, invalid response code. Cool. That's it. This was a really quick one. Uh, I had to make a decision between going really exhaustive and you know creating a catalog of all of the specific open source uh, packages and vendors that would fulfill each one of these technical requirements. And I opted not to do that because I figured what we can do is um, create a, like a wiki style doc out on the API craft group and have people sort of fill out, um, I'll take the first stab at it, filling out all the technologies that you would want under each of these. So just to summarize what we, what we walked through there is uh, the, the first step is setting up your DNS or your geo DNS to point to the proxy, finding a cloud platform to run it on, or you can run it inside your internal behind the firewall servers. Um, the capability that's in there is usually a combination of a web server, app server, or an API gateway. Uh, then you'll plug into that stuff with uh, subdomains, routing, URL routing, uh, drop it in a firewall to make sure that you force all of the app requests to go through the, the facade, uh, put caching, this is, you know, this is interesting in, in almost all cases, but especially in the geo, the geo distributed DNS case where you can have multiple facades in country. Uh, then an orchestration layer, the, the transformation, especially for XML, the JSON and back compression, um, the database. This is useful for just about anything you're going to do. Um, there's a, oftentimes you'll see where to create a pattern to make it work, especially in the orchestration case. You'll have lookup tables and other things that will be powered by a database. And then finally, um, dropping in the OAuth provider. Uh, like I said, this was a quick one today. We're just just quick 15 minutes of content. If there are any questions um, that came out of this stuff, uh, please go ahead and drop it into the chat. Can you please elaborate a bit on the API gateway? There are a bunch of vendors um, that provide API gateways, which you can think of them as like Swiss Army knives for doing stuff with HTTP. Um, most of the things that we've that we have on this list, um, minus say firewall and really deep orchestration. Uh, would be considered part of a typical API gateway. Um, a API companies include, um, I'm sorry, API gateway companies include folks like uh, Threescale, Mashery, Apogee, um, Layer 7. Is, they have some stuff that looks like an API gateway, it seems. Um, and I might be missing some. And I think there's some open source stuff coming out. And a lot of this stuff, there's some really interesting projects happening with Node.js as well around doing, um, I don't know the names of packages off the top of my head, but I've seen some stuff that looks pretty cool. And you're going to get that built-in sort of asynchronous programming model with Node.js, which will make it scale pretty well. Any other questions? At what point do you recommend moving to this architecture versus using namespace controllers in your native app? I think it's, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of it will have to do with the performance characteristics and the scale stuff that you see. You know, for example, like, uh, well, you could do a lot of this stuff, you know, caching just based on your, uh, based on your native app. Um, so uh, that's one thing to look at, especially if you have the geo distributed case, it's just really nice to pop up a layer to put it in the facade. The second case is if you really just truly have one app and I mean, it sounds like maybe I'm, I'm seeing like a little bit of a Ruby on Rails thing there with namespace controllers. If you just have one app, the API facade might not be useful for you at all because you can do this like in your routes, in your app and you can keep it really clean that way. It's really when you're talking about moving from one kind of core system of record to multiple complementary systems where the facade starts to come in really handy. Miguel asks, on the first few slides, you mentioned a DNS C name to an IP address. Did you mean an A record? No, in this case, I meant the C name. So it's because um, you want to say api.foo.com. So you probably just want API pointing to the facade. You probably don't want to filter all of your web traffic uh, through that address. That assumes that you have a domain name that also powers the website, like www.foo.com, and you have api.foo.com on the side. So I, I, I did mean C name. Sorry for if that was confusing at all. All right, folks. Yep. In the spirit of this uh, short webinar series, we're trying to keep these quick and to the point and just dump you, you know, kind of big, chunky ideas of content. Um, we'd love your feedback, though. If these, if these aren't working for you, if that was too short, or if you'd like to hear, have heard more or more depth, please provide that feedback to us and we'll, uh, we'll iterate it for the next time. Otherwise, thanks for tuning in for the, this one. And uh, actually, let me walk through my, my uh, closing slides here. So again, um, the webinars are on youtube.com slash Apogee. We have the API craft on IRC. 
and then check out that uh, Google group for API Craft. And you can, as always, you can contact me on Twitter, uh, Landlessness, or just hit me on email, brian at apogee.com. And special thanks again to Baruta for setting this up. And we'll see you next week. Next week, we're going to tackle uh, talking about the folks and the organization uh, that you want to have on the team to make this happen. Everybody from the API designers, the product managers, operations people, and what their roles are. Thanks for tuning in.